Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Monday, November 29th, after Virginia Tech's big rivalry win to keep the Commonwealth Cup in Blacksburg, a 29-24 victory over UVA in Charlottesville on Saturday. On episode 212 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, we'll recap the entire game, see where the Hokies may be going for their bowl game in December. We'll also look around the coaching carousel, which has started to spin a little bit faster over the last few days, and we'll check in on Hokies hoops after their rough week up in Brooklyn. All of that and much more coming up on a packed episode 212 of the Tech Sideline podcast, which starts right now. We welcome you into episode 212 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We hope you had a great Thanksgiving as well. We welcome you in however you are listening, whether that's archived on Stitcher, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts, or if you are watching on YouTube, if you're watching archived on YouTube, please be sure to drop a like, a comment, and subscribe to the Tech Sideline YouTube channel. And if you are in the live stream, drop a comment or question for Will and Chris. We will get to those at the very end of the show with Nick. As always, the Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. Hokies wrestling season already in full swing. They depend on your donations to the Southeast Regional Training Center, trying to bring Olympic hopeful athletes to Blacksburg. You can visit southeastrtc.com to learn more and donate today. Our usual Monday crew on set today, and we'll get to the little bit of a different uh, formation we're running on set uh, if you're watching on the YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jake Lyman. Across the way, founder and general manager of TechSideline.com, Will Stewart. To my right this time, it's going to be Chris Coleman, lead analyst and columnist for TechSideline.com. In the fourth chair, it's Nick Brown. And behind the scenes, as always, Malcolm Stewart does a great job as the best producer in the land. Will, we'll start with the uh, the elephant in the room here if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, I know you dropped an informative graphic on the tech sideline message boards to describe this change, but we have swapped places. We have. Somebody made the suggestion that uh, – so so once again, someone made a comment about what Chris looks like when you're doing the intro. And then somebody else is like, well, why don't we have Will and Jake to switch chairs? So uh, – I know you're thrilled by this if you're just listening on audio, but it, it is it is a huge change for us. <laughs> but there's the other elephant in the room. Did you see Katie's debut on the podcast? I did. Yeah, did a great are, job. Are you feeling the heat, man? <laughs> I am. I saw one of the comments on the YouTube uh, video from last week was, "Do we have a host controversy at Tech Sideline?" I was like, "Man, I've got to I've got to step up my game." Well, uh, <laughs> I, I may wind up splitting the workload between you guys. Have you do one and her do the other? You know, so. We'll see how it goes. We're we'll building depth. <laughs> That's right. There's some quality depth coming out of that. One of you the depth. portal. Yeah, you better it. hope I don't hit the transfer <laughs> portal, Will. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> All right, we can meet afterwards. Jake. Well, well uh, how was uh, everybody's Thanksgiving weekend? Good. Um, it, it's not just a Thanksgiving thing for us. It's eat the dinner, bring the 14 Christmas decoration totes out of the <laughs> attic. Which I'm so glad that Malcolm and my other son Ronan are grown adults now that they can help me with that process. And then Friday and Saturday is doing all the decorating, getting the lights up outside, family handles the inside. That is all done. And that all happened while I was going to uh, the Tech UVA game in Charlottesville. So we got it all done. What about you guys? Well, normal Thanksgiving day. Other than that, it kind of sucked until the football game because Tech lost both basketball games. Oof, like was... when they lost those basketball games, and then I woke up Saturday morning and I'm like, man, we're about to get swept. <laughs> this weekend, it's, it's not going to be fun, but then Tech won the football game. So yeah, and the that made it a lot better. The women's basketball game had lost the the opening game in Puerto Rico. Is that where they yes, were? Yes, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Now, Missouri State went to the Sweet 16 last year. Yeah, but still. It still sucks. <laughs> I want to win them all. Still, <laughs> nice trip for Evan Hughes. Oh, yeah. Yes. He got, yeah. His whole yeah. family went and to his family. <laughs> yes. The perks yes. of being Virginia Tech women's basketball radio announcer. <laughs> right. Puerto Rico. In that first game, they they struggled in the first quarter. They picked it up though. I mean, uh, but and then they won their second game. I forget who who they play in game two. Uh, UT Martin. UT Martin beat, so. him, beat him by four, so it wasn't. Okay. And Tech only scored fifty three. So but, yeah, yeah, and that's well, with okay. nineteen from Kitley. It, it's a rare occasion for Kenny Brooks's team to lose a non conference game. I feel like they win that's every true. single one. Uh, I know they haven't lost a non conference game at home since he's come to Tech. 
So well, if they want to flip the script and lose a few early and then like go undefeated through the ACC, that would be awesome. <laughs> yes, uh, and they have a big one, Big Ten ACC challenge this week, heading up to Madison to face Wisconsin. So right. Evan Hughes getting right back on a plane. Yeah, it's, this one's going to be a little bit colder for him. Like yes, Puerto probably yeah. not as much of a destination. For one Evan of these Hughes. things is not like the other. <laughs> Well, Chris mentioned the highlight of the week for Hokies fans. Virginia Tech's win over UVA on Saturday, 29-24. Uh, a thriller all the way to the end. Hokies fans maybe uh, thought they blew it with the Connor Blumrick fumble at the very end, but they, they pulled it off 17 out of 18 for Virginia Tech back-to-back -back after losing back in 2019. Uh, wasn't much hope going in, but, man, J.C. Price had them ready to play. Uh, definitely focus was there, emotion was there, and they got it done. I thought, uh, you know, just if, if I could kind of sum it up, uh, first of all, I found it to be one of the more enjoyable wins in, in recent. And I prefer to say 21 of 23. I think that sounds better than, what, 17, 17 out of, of 18? Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's the two. Once you get five. up in the 20s, but it starts to sound bad. It becomes kind of mean. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Tech did not get off to a good start on offense. UVA scored. Tech got the big play. Yep. UVA scored, you know, and, and I thought, uh, two really critical moments in the football game, if we want to drill right down into yeah. in the talking about the game. Uh, Brennan Armstrong's interception on their third possession was, was big. Uh, they scored, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, on four of their first five possessions. Touchdown, touchdown, interception, yeah. touchdown, field goal. And, oh, by the way, that, that field goal happened at the beginning of the third quarter. So, yeah. UVA didn't have many possessions. And uh, can you do me a favor? And one thing I've not even looked up yet is time of possession. Um, well, I got you. Nick, check on it. I I did write down, you're right, four of the first five possessions UVA scored, 24 points, did not score a point on their last five drives of the game, though. Yeah, and, and so they were they were up 14-7, and, uh, you know, all indications were they were just going to keep going. They'd had a 10-play drive for a touchdown, 11-play drive for a touchdown, and it was on the 10th play of the third possession <clears throat> that, that Armstrong threw the interception. Yep. They dropped Panay back in the zone, zone blitz type thing, and I think it crossed Armstrong up. And yeah, the um, most of his interceptions don't come off uh, bad throws; they come off bad reads, and he made right. a bad read on that one. Uh, and I watched a little bit of, of Bronco Mendenhall's post game press conference yesterday, and they asked him what went wrong, why did you lose the game, and he just said, you know, off the top of my head, I would say turnovers, and uh, yeah, the interception and then the fumble were both on Tech side of the field; they were driving. And the other play that was basically like a turnover was when Virginia Tech punted and UVA, for whatever reason, even though they were going to get the ball back with like two and a half minutes left at midfield, they decided to rush rush the punter. And yeah. at that point, Tech's defense was not stopping the UVA offense. Yeah. And they roughed the punter and got Tech yeah. a first down, and Tech went down and got a field goal right before halftime. So that's possibly a 10-point swing right there. And that play is like a turnover because yes. Virginia Tech had punted it to them, yep. they were going to have the ball, and then just really like that, good field position. Right, it was fourth right. and it, twenty-two, also. Yeah, yes. right. So <laughs> it was just uh, it was a strange decision, I think, for for them to to try to go after that punt block. But in effect, it became UVA's third turnover. Yeah, yeah and and so that's two critical moments at which they could have gone up by two scores. Mm -hmm. They could have gone up twenty-one-seven, you know, if they score mm -hmm. a touchdown, and they could have gone up twenty-eight-fourteen if they'd mm -hmm. scored a touchdown. Instead, Tech goes. All the way down the field and kicks a field goal to make it 21 17 at the half. So those are both huge. Yep. Well, and the Hokies forced three turnovers, I will say. The safety didn't count as a turnover, but right. really it probably should have counted as one. Uh, I want to go through this late game sequence. It started games 24 24 after Virginia Tech had the, the Philly special uh, to tie yeah, the game up. Yeah. And down at the 17 yard line, Virginia fumbles. You mentioned that one. That's really where it felt like it flipped. Hokies then go on a 12-play, seven-minute drive to get the lead and then force a three and out right after that. That three-drive sequence really flipped the momentum a little bit for Virginia Tech. When uh, when they fumbled, it was 99 Thompson who fumbled, right, yep. the, the football player. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, he made that catch, and we were, Tech was going to tackle him for a short short game, but Breon Murray Breon missed the Murray tackle. It. And I was watching that game in a bar, <laughs> and the whole bar went nuts. <laughs> when he missed that tackle, everybody just started <laughs> screaming and yelling. And then I, I think I was like, the first person to realize that he actually fumbled. So I'm sitting there celebrating. Everybody else is still cussing, <laughs> cussing Breon Murray because he missed the tackle. And we came to the conclusion that that was the best missed tackle in the history of Virginia Tech football. Indeed it was. It was, it was very fortunate. Yes. 
Yes, for sure. Uh, and after that, again, 12 play, seven minute field goal drive made it 27 24. Hokies get the ball back after the punt, take four more minutes off the clock. And that's something that the offense hadn't been doing over the last couple of weeks. They had a couple of methodical drives late that chewed clock, helped them get this win. Well, when you can run the football like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. UVA's defense, as we talked about time and time again last week, has been atrocious this year. So there was no reason why the Hokies shouldn't have gone up there and, and run the football yeah. on them. And they did. They dominated them on the ground, as you would expect, which um, – Makes me even a little more angrier at the Miami game when Blackshear only got two carries. Because yeah. you clearly see what that guy's capable of doing when he touches the ball. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when you. It was, it was a limited possession game because of Virginia Tech's. Which is one of the things Tech needed to do, right, and they yeah, did they it. Need, well. They needed to limit the possessions, and, and they were able to do that. And uh, just the fact that you said UVA scored on four of their first five drives, is that right? Well, that fifth drive didn't come until the third quarter. Yeah. So they only had the ball four times in the first half. I have the time of possession, by the way. It's a lot closer than you think. 31 minutes, 18 seconds for Tech, and then 28-42 for UVA. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily about the time of possessions. It's the limited number of possessions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and UVA ran more plays, right? I think they ran 70 and Tech ran 64 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 70 for UVA and then yeah, well, yeah, you know, 63 for Tech. Yeah, and I, I think I guess that. It would have been the other way around if Tech hadn't fumbled there on their last drive, and that gave UVA about yeah. probably about six more exactly. six yes. more plays. <laughs> and and it's not like um, it's not like Virginia Tech didn't make didn't have terrible things go wrong. Blumerick's fumble is the obvious mm-hmm. one, but Burmeister running all the way down to the UVA three, mm-hmm. and then Tech comes away empty, empty. Yep. You yeah. know, and that that's not. I don't think that's something people are really going to remember. No, that, that's you know that's a right. huge failure in the red zone I, that really could at that point them. I'm like, man, their offense is so good that we can't choke away red zone opportunities like no. this and win the game. So you were yeah. obviously extremely concerned at that point. Yeah. Well, and we don't want to just hate on Connor Blumrick here, but that fourth down throw to Raheem Blackshear, well designed play. Blumrick made the right read when mm-hmm. the safety dropped down and tried to. Uh, stop the run, yeah. just missed the throw. And I guess that's – is that not a play Braxton Burmeister could make uh, is the question there? Well, yeah. sure. I mean, he, yeah. well, Blumert could have made it too, but, I mean, he just he didn't. Um, I, you know, I, I I feel like Blumert should play just to take some of the running pressure off of Burmeister because, you know, Tech's going to be a run-heavy focused offense. We know that. Yeah. And for whoever they play in the bowl game, Virginia Tech is going to be running it a lot. And you want to manage Burmeister to a certain extent. That said, I don't think you can play Blumer that much because, you know, it just seemed to me watching the game that every time he came into the game, UVA was like, yeah, they're not going to throw it. Yeah. No way they're going to throw it. I mean, yeah. we're going to stack up against the run. And he had 10 carries against them, but only for 28 yards. He did not get the fairly big gains that he's been getting. Correct. Right? They, they were they, all like three This is a terrible run defense, and they limited him. Correct. So, uh, Nick, can you look up the – I know Tech had something like 326 yards rushing. How many carries was that? Three. Uh, yep, 320 total yards, well, net yards on 47 carries. 47 carries. So, did you say you had 10 carries for 28 yards? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, the other right. 37 carries netted about 300 yards. Yes. Right. You know, interesting. And, oh, yeah, I mean, they were just breaking off huge yardage yeah. right, against UVA. I mean, well, if you look at some of the PFF grades of Tech's offensive linemen, preliminary grades, it's understandable. Parker Clements, true freshman, was like a 92. And he played every down, and by the way. He played wow. every down at right tackle. Luke Tenuto, pretty much the same score yeah. at left tackle. And then Caden Moore at right guard, another true freshman, was really, really good also. The, the one lineman who played a lot who didn't grade out all that great was Brock Hoffman, but he's hurt. Right. You know, you could see him limping around, right. and he still, he still played a lot of downs. Yeah, yeah. Well, Braxton Burmeister, the 71-yard run we just mentioned that got them down there, didn't score. Uh, Raheem Blackshear, 9.4 yards per carry. And again, you mentioned it. It just doesn't make I just, much sense that he didn't. He got two carries against Miami. That guy, he's over 700 rushing yards now. But over his last six games, uh, he's rushed for over 500 yards. Yeah. And that includes the two-carry, three-yard performance against Miami. So basically, you break it down over – if you throw out the Miami game over his last five games, he's averaging over 100 yards a game. Yeah. This is a guy who could have been a thousand yard rusher for 12 Virginia to 1300 yards if he was used properly and the offensive line had been playing better earlier in right. the season. And I, I'll go, always go back to that Notre Dame game where he was the best player on the field for either team for the first half and into the early third quarter of that game, and then they just stopped giving him the ball. 
and you lose by three points. I mean, and and you know it was a couple weeks after that when Virginia Tech, you know, they shortened their their running back rotation and he started getting more touches. Uh, but even then, he was still only getting in the twelve to fifteen range every game and he got 18 against UVA and I mean I just think he's Tech's best player would have had more if he'd had some shorter runs yeah right (laughs) exactly (laughs) Um, so I I think uh, he's the dude man you gotta you gotta feed that guy whoever plays Tech in the bowl game should get a heavy dose over Raheem Blackshear you're not saving him for the next week at that point I would give that dude the ball as much as does he have any eligibility remaining yeah yeah he did not go through senior day Hmm. so he's got a sixth COVID year uh, next year and he did not go through senior day Neither did Burmeister. So that signifies that they are at least willing to possibly come back next year, depending on who the coach is and everything like that. So that could be at least a core if the new coach comes in and is able to retain him. Burmeister, Blackshear, Dax Hollyfield's already said he's coming back. So a core of leaders that you would have on that team. Uh, Speaking of some of the older guys, Jordan Williams coming in from Clemson. I think everybody thought maybe this is the game-changing player we could have up front. And maybe he hadn't lived up to that up until 3:17 left in the game, he strips Brennan Armstrong and probably should have won the game for Virginia Tech at that point Certainly. if Alan Tisdale can fall on it yeah. or if the recovering offensive lineman for Virginia recovers it at the one instead yeah, of on no. the goal line. Yeah. Uh, but would have made it a two-score game instead, 29-24, but possibly the biggest play of the game. At that yeah, point. and you know, if you look at, I guess, what people would consider two, Tech's two biggest wins this year, the first game against UNC and the last game, um, it was Jordan Williams involved at the end. Like, remember, he was the guy that was tackling the UNC quarterback, Sam Howell, when he threw that pick when right at the end of the game. That thing just over chucked his, it right behind his head or okay. whatever. Exactly. He pulled a Ryan Willis and just <laughs> threw it over his head. <laughs> down, down the field. Um, and, uh, and then this game, you know, almost not, not the last defensive play for Virginia Tech because the, the offense went on to fumble it away. But yeah, it was him and Amari Barno who, who made that play. So, uh, he uh, he has br- honestly probably been Virginia Tech's most consistent player, defensive player this year. If you, if you just look yeah. at the PFF grades, he and Tay Daly. I, I would and, say. and that and that play was so huge because it just changes the end of the game. If UVA is down there, they kick a field goal to tie it, and we go to overtime without that safety. Yeah. Right. So it's twenty nine twenty four. Hokies get the onside kick. Trey Turner did not play in the game. cameo. But he, yeah. he stepped in on the hands team, made the grab possibly. They kicked it right to him. Possibly his final play as a, as a Hokie. Not sure if he'd play in the bowl game. Um, yeah, it's hard to say because he's, uh, he's already committed to the senior bowl and wants to start training for the NFL and mm-hmm. things like that. So we'll see. I mean, you'll see bowl opt-outs all over the country. I think you'll see more and more of those as time goes by. But that was, that was really – Probably the impressive thing about this is you go up there and you win without Trey Turner. Yeah. Did the ACC Network ever show a replay of that onside kick? I, I don't, don't think believe they, they did. did. I I but I was too busy celebrating. It, so. it, it <laughs> looked like it, I think it's underrated as as a as a recovery. So first of all, let's give let's give James Shebest credit. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe not. Maybe this was just chance, but it sure looked planned out. So UVA comes up and they and they kick the onside kick. And the front line guys for Tech just parted mm-hmm. and let the ball go between them, which is, again, an underappreciated part of that play. If those guys right at the 10-yard point try to recover that thing, yeah. you know, Trey had a lot of time to look at it. And I think, again, they didn't show a replay. I think right before it got to him, it hopped. And I think he wound up catching it up here, like right up near his head. If that's what happened, I'd have to go back and watch it again. That's a phenomenal recovery, one that they could have used, like, during the 2007 game against Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> So after that, it seemed like the game was over. Hokies needed one first down to ice the game away. And then, of course, it almost looked like disaster struck. We mentioned Connor Blumrick fumbles uh, the ball. UVA recovers. Uh, It seemed like it was going to be another heartbreaker for Virginia Tech in a season that's already had so many with Notre Dame and Syracuse. Uh, But the defense stood up big. And Tay Daly, another big play at the end, Uh, possibly the Hokies' most important player on Saturday. Yeah. For sure, and uh, I think it really hurt Virginia Tech against Miami when he went out of that game early with, with, with the targeting. Uh, he's been Virginia Tech's most consistent player on the back end this year. Um, yeah. You know, he didn't start that first game against UNC, but he came in off the bench, rotated in, and, and played well that night. And, you know, slowly but steadily he earned the trust of the coaching staff and has become a reliable safety for Tech. And, you know, another guy who got more snaps in the secondary this past week was Jalen Strong. I think yeah. he got 26 snaps. 
it, it's safety. And he was and, in there for that final drive. Yeah, he was. And interesting. Uh, and you didn't notice him all that much. And if you don't get noticed <laughs> as a safety, that probably means Usually you, you, did, you did okay out there. Yeah. And, and I thought, you know, uh, Virginia Tech's coverage throughout the game was meh, but I thought in the fourth quarter their their cover coverage was excellent. I, I Some thought of the so. plays on the sideline. Yeah, and, it was. They they, they they they. I thought they they text defensively. They they just seemed a little passive in in the oof. first in the first half. <laughs> a little. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm trying to be kind here. It was almost like they. It's almost like they were playing like they didn't think they could win. And they didn't have any pop to him, right? Until well, I mean, got, even the first touchdown yeah. that VVA <laughs> scored was Dorian Strong. Well, he he did the Matador impression, but if you watched Tisdale on that play, like he didn't run over, he didn't want any part of that tackle. It didn't yeah. look like he didn't run run to the Jelani ball. Woods, right? and, Woods, and, yeah, yeah and, the, and there were a couple other plays where I, I I saw Tech defenders. They just they weren't running to the ball as hard as you could yeah. run. To. I so, saw Jordan Williams once a play went to the outside, just kind of jogging along right, a couple of times. Right. right. So yeah. I, I don't think the intensity was there in the first half. Um, yeah. And I know Brennan Armstrong coming up lame, you know, affected things for UVA to a certain extent in the second half, but there was, I also just saw more aggressiveness from, from the tech defense. And I'm not, I'm not talking about schematically because I thought tech was blitzing a lot in, in the first half too. And the UVA was just picking them up. I, I just thought tech, they played, tougher and they play with more confidence and and they just i don't know what got said at halftime but they just seem more into the game in wow the half. so so jelani woods outweighs dorian strong by 90 pounds oh yeah yeah that was <laughs> to not be fair that, 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 that was too. not going to end well for, for dorian strong the, look the dorian result, was in the end the, zones the, the, the result was going to be the same even if you attempted to <laughs> live, live to play it, another it was, down it was, the guy who had the best chance at it would have been tisdale who was closer Mm-hmm. Yes. He just didn't what didn't seem like he was running to the and ball was coming right. more from the side right. um yeah so I, I was in i was in the horseshoe part of the end zone so that touchdown occurred far away from me the opposite know? end the total yeah. opposite yeah. end and when i got home i saw people talking on the boards about you know what strong had done on that touchdown i thought well what are they talking about and it, it was kind of actually worse than i would have imagined <laughs> yeah watching it live you thought man he probably should have made that play but watching the replay it's like he took one step towards him and then one step back he was right. like i'm gonna get out of the way well i'm glad we can laugh about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well uh, then dorian goes and takes down the offense alignment oh and the, yeah let's the greatest talk about play let's, ever. let's talk about the billy bob play. <laughs> uh, you ever seen varsity blues yes oh god oh, yeah. so that that play only works in varsity blues come on now that's not it's not the exact same play they ran in varsity blues and varsity blues they threw it to the wide receiver who then pitched it to the offensive lineman billy bob it's, this time they just straight up is that the it. game where billy bob was hung over and puking or was that a different game? that was a different that was a, that was a different game they lost the game he was hung over and puking. uh yeah anyway uh yeah they threw it out there and uh Dorn strong heads up play like tech was in zone i don't know exactly what what uva was expecting on that play i don't know if they expected tech to be in man and then strong would have his back turned and nobody would be there. Well, uh, Barno was there too for it as well. Yeah, so Tech had a, seemed to have a couple of zone defenders on that side of the field. So I don't know if if UVA thought Tech was going to be in a different coverage. But, but if you've got a cornerback squatted in a short zone right there, that play should not work. Yeah, <laughs> that that, that the, the level of risk in that play. Uh, it was on third down mm, and eleven. Seven. Yes. Yeah. So so he lines up. Not well, as an eligible receiver, so, so he, it has to be a back. So he had pass. to he backed up behind the line of scrimmage. So in effect, they put themselves into like a third and twelve <coughs> situation and because they had to throw it to him behind the line. Of you're scrimmage. asking an offensive lineman to catch a thrown lateral. Mm-hmm. I just they sat in a meeting room and thought this was a good idea. Well, and Bronco Manningold <laughs> defended it after the game too. <laughs> he he well, said, "We've he, had this all year. Yeah, well, well, we're against our defense he, in practice. Well, he, of course, everything works against their defense. God." Um, I, the thing is, like he, he said it, and I saw this part of his press conference. He's like, "You've got to be really disciplined to defend that play," and they were they were really disciplined. But I look at it where Tech was in zone, and you know the receiver went cut up in a little post pattern, which is why I think UVA thought Tech was going to be in man. They thought Dorian Strong would have his back turned, and he'd be following his man receiver. That and, makes sense, right? Right, and but he wasn't. He was in zone. He was just standing there doing what he was supposed to be doing and he saw him throw it to the tackle and he just <laughs> rolled up and, and tackled him i mean I, I just it was it was a miscalculation by uva i think in what co- what what coverage they thought tech was going to do be we in. remember which of uva's lineman it was, it was number 70. 70 oh his number last 70. name was bobby <laughs> Bobby, you ever so with billy bob so right? he outweighs dorian strong by let me see here 
120 pounds. Oh. <laughs> so he did not quite have the momentum. The moment. yeah, he wasn't yeah, close yeah. to the goal. Yeah. And I, I will give them credit. I think maybe if it's third and goal from the one, sure. like let's say it's at the one and you were expecting your left tackle to run three Are feet you? instead of 30 feet to get into the end zone. Right. It just felt like even if the Hokies were in man, somebody was going to be able to chase him down before we <laughs> yeah. got to the end zone. Yeah. Uh, but that one, and then the Hokies got the stop on fourth down to end the game there. So, But, but you have to compare and contrast the way the Philly special worked and yes. the, and the, for, for Tech. And you know, Laser actually called that the Blacksburg special during the play. Mm-hmm. While it was oh, happening. he knew it was coming. He, I, got it. Well, I don't know if he knew he probably knew that he recognized that, it. And he like, said he had seen his it wife practice. is a huge Eagles. Oh fan. yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, so so he, he called it the Philly special before uh, before Robinson even threw the ball. He called yeah. it Philly's or he called it Blacksburg Black special, special mid play. Wow, yeah. heads up! And I, I loved his call at the end there uh, when ball falls incomplete. Go back to your room, little brother. <laughs> that was great. Ooh, you, know, <laughs> you know, he, he had been thinking of that one. Yeah. I'm sure he's had that locked and loaded Saving since last year. Um, big day for the Hokies offensively as well. We mentioned the Philly special. That was the final touchdown for the Hokies on the day. But Braxton Burmeister, he was very effective. I mean, big plays with his legs. He had the big touchdown Chunk to Tavion plays. Robinson. A uh, big play to Dwayne Lofton, who had a nice catch as well. So Yeah, it seemed like whenever Tech completed a pass, it was for big chunk yardage. I mean, yeah. wait, Tech only completed five passes in the game. But I can think of, you know, obviously the long one to Robinson for a touchdown. Obviously the, the long one to Lofton. There was another uh, one to Robinson on a corner route that went for a big play. Right, right. That was the one where Caleb Smith came in motion, and that was Burmeister, the Burmeister threw it to him out in the flat. Right, yeah. and and then there was one other to Lofton over the middle that I think went for a first down. I think all five of of Tech's completed passes went for either, well, excuse me, six they, completed they, passes. They were, seven, they were seven. They were seven of sixteen. So, okay, so uh, I, I, I I think I think every Tech completed pass I could be wrong went for either a first down or a touchdown. Yeah. So they they, they, they didn't they didn't pass the ball a lot. But they seem to pick their spots wisely, and when they picked it, they generally I was tracking the, for big plays. I was tracking the passes. Burmeister started the game five of seven. He mm-hmm. finished six of fourteen. Right. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I believe the one of seven at the end there was the long one to Tavion Robinson that set up that uh, set up the game winning field goal. Correct, mm. possibly. Yeah, uh, that's so yeah. probably right. Yeah. Yep. He, he probably came through at the biggest moment there. And we mentioned Raheem Blackshear's huge day on the ground. 9.4 yards per carry, 320 yards on the ground for Virginia Tech. Uh, big day for the offense and for the defense. That's the second lowest points that UVA has been held to this year I wondered with about Brennan that. Armstrong as their starting quarterback. What was the first? Somebody beat him 37-13, right? Was it Wake? Uh, oh, 40 well, to 17 against Wake. Yeah, I watched that. It was a Friday night game, and it was not competitive from the very beginning. But UVA... <laughs> God, I remember the start of that game. I think thanks to penalties, like Wake had like ran like no, no UVA ran like eight plays from inside the ten yard line on their first drive of the game, and they didn't score. Didn't score. I remember that. Yeah. Well, and that was part of that streak. They had played North Carolina the week before, did not force the Tar Heels to punt the entire game, and and then Wake Forest didn't punt until middle of the fourth quarter. The next game, yes. So that was yeah. No punts in over seven quarters of football. So I would have you know that that. We, we we use so many different terms to describe how bad the UVA defense was last week. Running out. Podcast. Running mm-hmm. out, man. They're, they're atrocious. And I think this goes back to their style of play. And I think this is ultimately what undid Dan Mullen at Florida. You know, when they had Kyle Trask, they just started throwing the ball all over the field. Pass, 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 pass. When you run that type of offense, a Big 12-style offense, what most people consider a Big 12-style offense, I think, it's, I think it softens you up defensively. On good, on good in practice, the defense is just yeah. sitting there defending the pass the whole time. And don't get me wrong, UVA has more prop; they have other problems on defense too, besides a lack of toughness. But you know, I think when you're so unbalanced on offense, when you rarely ever run the football, then I, I just think that softens you up uh, defensively. Uh, so I, I think Bronco needs to look at his offense from a more holistic point of view. Right. Yes, Brennan Armstrong's your best player, but you also have to. You have to ha- also have to think about your defense a little bit. And as a former defense, defensive coach, I feel like he should know that. Um, I don't know that he's, I don't know that he's done a great job of coaching this year. Yeah, uh, from and, that perspective. You know, and he he got out coached by a, a 
a staff that is arguably in disarray. You know, yeah. they don't don't know where the next job's coming from. Yeah, I, I think the motivation was there for for the tech coaching staff, but there's a lot going on around that program. Yeah, yeah. and and part of you know we all picked UVA to win. Uh, the the fans in the poll picked UVA to win. I, I think. Uh, more of them picked UVA oh, to win by ten plus. Than yeah, anything I think it, else. I think it was fifty three. I put it in my article yesterday. I think it's fifty three percent of fans in our poll picked UVA to win by double by digits. Double digits. And I the, read that and I thought, man, and, is that right? And then another fourteen percent picked them to win by single digits. So sixty seven percent, two thirds of Virginia Tech fans in our poll at least thought UVA was going to win that football game. We all picked UVA. I only picked them by seven. I, and I didn't pick them because I thought they were like really better than Tech. I'm just like, you know, I, it's just hard to say. Like what our players are feeling right yeah. now, and and in the first half, I thought that seemed right because I didn't think our defense was playing particularly motivated. It yeah. just didn't look like. But man, they whatever happened at halftime, I don't know. That that would be an interesting well, story. It, one it's day. just like the UNC game. We all picked UNC to win because the best player on the field was the opposing quarterback, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Yeah, Brennan Armstrong all year long has been the best player on the field, yeah. and I, I figured that'd be the difference. Yeah. Well, you know. I, th I thought Tech clearly outcoached the UNC staff on, on the opening game of the season. Yeah. And they clearly outcoached Bronco this time, although I, I don't think it's necessarily like anything the Tech staff did. It's more about some of the decisions Bronco made himself. Like, mm -hmm. why do you go after the, the punt block right there? Yeah. Why do you throw – why do you – why, why do you – Throw it to a, an offensive why, line. Why do you take the ball out of the hands of – your star quarterback and all those really good receivers and throw it to an offensive lineman on third down for With the 45 seconds left right, in the game. Right, like, right. this is it, dude. Right, right. This, is, this isn't a you fun thing to do. You have two plays. It's not a fun thing to do in the second quarter. This is the ball game. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, and I think J.C. Price deserves a lot of credit for what he did. And it was a cool – I don't know if you got to see his post-game mm -hmm. interview. I thought that was a really cool moment for him. It, if that is his last game coaching for Virginia Tech, there's a chance he's retained on the next staff. But yeah, and cool the, to, to get a win against the rival. There's certain things you, you're allowed to do when you when you beat a rival. You can light up a cigar you can on the field. Right, right on the field. You know, which, which is – because there's a great picture of him after the 95 game as a player smoking a cigar as he's walking out of the tunnel out of the stadium. Yeah. After Tech won that game. So on his and, personal Twitter feed, he's got the, yeah. the black and white picture from the 1995 game and a picture from yeah. this game. I think I, I used that picture. That, that picture was in the, the Hokie Huddler, and I think I used it in my 1995 series that I wrote Did you? last wow. year. I, yeah, because cool. I, I remember seeing that picture before. Um, so that, Burmeister takes the final knee, and he walks towards the UVA student section, and he's just see, like... See, I didn't like, see that. Oh, yeah, I saw it. it That's the first time I've seen Burmeister show any excitement. Oh, he, was, <laughs> he, he went over there, and he let them have it. And I could tell it was a UVA student section because Tech was going from the hill towards, towards the, the bowl end in yeah. their last possession of the game on the kneel down. So he walked back. He didn't... Like, normally, you walk up the field, you kind of walk off towards the 50. He took the opposite angle, like towards the UVA <laughs> student section. So I did want to throw this out there when we were talking about Burmeister and Blumrick earlier. Um, part of me thinks Burmeister's hurt even worse than he's letting on. After the long run, he got up, and it's kind of hard to describe, but he was kind of bent a little bit sideways, like whatever's going on with him was really bothering oh, him. Oh, he's But he, a lot di of pain. he didn't. You, he's one thing about Burmeister's face is it's always just so <laughs> it's, it's just just so even killed looks yeah. the same you know yeah. and I thought man I think that guy's in a lot of pain but you can't really can't tell, tell. I think he, he's he been in pain since probably the Middle Tennessee game uh, when he took that hit I, yeah. I don't know if he's been fully healthy uh, since that day mentioning the post game scene I thought it was cool tech students rushing UVA's field <laughs> uh, Brock Hoffman <laughs> Doing the uh, the Baker Mayfield and planting the flag in, in center uh, in the middle of the field, I thought that was. Uh, it's actually cool more scene. fun to beat UVA in Charlottesville than it is. At home. <laughs> it is. It's true. Um, and for me, that goes back to uh, I believe it. Nick, can you look it up? I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to get this story right. It was my freshman year, and uh, Tech rolled up to UVA and beat them uh, forty-eight nothing. I think they call it the eighty-three squeaker. Um, and it was it was in Charlottesville and. Uh, so I, I was there with my roommate, and um, yeah, 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 I remember this. So my, so I grew up in Charlottesville, and my tech roommate was a guy I went to high school with in Charlottesville, and his dad was a banker, and he could get pretty good tickets. So I remember sitting there at the 1983 game that Tech won 48 nothing, and me and my buddy Carl were arguing over, like, I think he's on one side of the 50, and I'm on the other side of the 50. We had great <laughs> seats to witness that. And late in the game, we're, we're sitting there, 
and it's a complete blowout. And now remember, this is way back then, not many fans were the school colors. So you couldn't look and go, that's a Tech fan, that's a UVA fan, like you can these yeah, days. People wore their regular clothes to football games. Or, or, Maybe you'll throw on a Tech hat, but that, <laughs> or, that's it. Or to, which would really annoy you. I, I see pictures of Tech basketball games from back then. And everybody's wearing either just plain clothes or some sweatshirt for another university, not even Virginia Tech. <laughs> so anyway, back to the story. We're sitting there, and, and there's this mass of people building in the back of the end zone over near the hill. And my buddy Carl and I are like, what's going on? And the game ended, and they rushed the field and tore the goalpost down. It was <laughs> Tech fans, and they carried it around Charlottesville, the whole deal. So the next year, when I'm a sophomore, 1984, we won't drill down into this game too much. UVA, <laughs> UVA came in and won 26 to 23. So their fans spilled out onto the field to try to tear down the Lane Stadium goalposts, and that led to just brawls that went on for like five or ten <laughs> minutes. You know, I remember standing there in the stands and just. And just, by the way, if I could go back, I'd go down on the field, but I was standing there. In the <laughs> you didn't stadium. get into a scuffle? I did not get into it. Well, 5'8", buck 60. You know? <laughs> but I just remember seeing masses of fans moving this way and that way as, as you know, just watching all that unfold. So anyway, that's the history of trying to tear down the goalposts and rushing the field and things like that. We need to bring that back. I think that should be our goal next time. Uh, the Hokies play in Charlottesville, uh, 2023, I guess, would be the next time. Yep, so yep. Uh, lots to look forward to there. Hokies are now bowl eligible, so we get to look forward to one more football game this year. Where we think the Hokies are going to end up, I've heard Charlotte, Annapolis. I yeah, think. more people are saying Annapolis at this point, which would be uh, East Carolina because they've already accepted yep. a bid to the, the military, military bowl. bowl. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Charlotte, Duke's Mayo Bowl. Uh, there, there was some tweet or rumor yesterday that – there could be a setup here for Shane Beamer's Gamecocks and the Hokies to meet uh, in in, Charlotte. in the Duke Mayo Bowl. So now the two teams are scheduled to play in I think twenty twenty five in Atlanta. Atlanta. In Atlanta. Which, so if, I don't know why that game's not in Charlotte. Uh, I know. It, so if Shane hangs in there for that'll be his fifth year, I guess. I guess yeah. So, yeah. If he hangs in there, he'll he'll be coaching against Virginia Tech. And whoever the Hokies' next coach is, we're hoping to find out soon. We're going to get into the coaching carousel in the second half of the show. But either way, bowl eligible, if, if it's one of those two places, a place the Hokies are familiar with. Last time they were in a bowl was in Charlotte, and then I believe the year before that was in Annapolis. So uh, That's right. Yep. Common destination. Yes, exactly. At least if it is in Annapolis, it won't be Cincinnati this time. So <laughs> uh, with that, let's toss it over to Nick in the fourth chair. What you got for us today? Welcome back to another edition of Stat Time with Scott Glessner. <laughs> He's got some bangers out here today. This was the first time that Virginia Tech had two different quarterbacks in the same season have a 100-yard rushing day. What? This is through 1985 is the Makes last sense. one. yeah. Um, and then since 1985 as well, the 6.8 uh, rush in yards per play uh, averages the highest for Tech versus UVA. Mm -hmm. No surprise there. Uh, and then this one caught me off guard. Virginia Tech has had 40 rushes a game versus 40 plus rushes a game versus UVA in the past 23 out of the 24 games. Wow. In that same stretch, UVA only has 40 plus rushes in two of the last 24 versus Tech. Maybe there's a lesson there for UVA. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. And then first time since at least 1985 in the series, both teams average at least 6.5 yards per play. Again, yeah. no surprise there. It's funny. It didn't feel like a shootout. You know, it wound up It felt like it early. And, yeah. You know, let, let me make a comment there about 40-plus rushes. In so many of those games, you know, over the last two decades, Virginia Tech has been leading by quite a lot of points in a yeah. lot of them. So UVA is in more situations yeah. where they need to throw the football. Well, and, and getting down into the history of it, uh, my, my junior year, Tech won 28-10 in Charlottesville, and Tech just ran the football the entire second half. It's it's probably the only two, time in 2001. My uh, Kevin Jones, yeah, Kevin, Kevin Jones, Jones had 30, 38 carries, 37 yeah, carries, yeah. something like that. <laughs> he almost had that himself. Yeah. Uh, and then my dad actually, I don't know why he got into it, but I know Mr. Lyman over here loves sports betting. Uh, Virginia <laughs> Tech with seven point dogs to UVA. That's only the third upset uh, since 1998. Against the spread. Yeah, wow. Against the spread. And so 98 was UVA's win, and then 2019, Tech was favored by two points. Were they really? At Charlottesville. Of course, they won that game, and then this one. This is by far the biggest, um, biggest upset. I don't know. Tech was favored by two, and UVA won by nine. That's 11 points. Uh, this was 12 points. Yeah, talking about there just the spread. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. So there you go. Now, 
That'll be about it for me. That's all you got? All, all right, right, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, pretty Nick. Good. That was Scott, good. Scott I, carried Nick. Scott, Scott, Scott got the Scott's beginning the of man. it, but yeah, Nick's, <laughs> Nick had some good ones at the end there. I like the... Uh, well, if you want to preview some basketball, it's Len Bias night at Maryland on Wednesday. So, Virginia Tech's going into a that sounds pretty uh, <laughs> fun environment. That Although, no, honestly, how many of those Maryland students even know who Len Bias is? <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah, that's a good. Point. Well, I was scrolling through their Twitter, and it's like every three, every third video that they post is like a Len Bias dunk or something mm-hmm. that they just. Now, of course, he just got inducted in the college basketball fan, yeah. but it's that they still worship the man. Yeah. Well, Hokies are going to try and avoid three losses in a row when they head to College Park on Wednesday. That's a big one. Big Ten ACC challenge starts this week. Have, uh, have they settled? Uh, I think I was looking at the schedules and and. They were still saying ESPN or ESPN. I think it's ESPN two yeah, seven fifteen. Right. <laughs> okay. I think they announced that yesterday okay. at, at some point. So, Hokies heading up to College Park. We're going to dive into their week in Brooklyn on the other side. But first, we're going to look at the coaching carousel and see where things stand for the Hokies as they try and find their next head man of the football program. All of that coming up after the break. Stay with us here on episode two hundred and twelve of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We'll be right back.
We welcome you back into episode 212 of the Tech Sideline podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. We've already talked about Virginia Tech's big Commonwealth Cup victory over Virginia. We are now saying that's 21 out of 23 or 17 out of 18, depending on how you want to look at it. Now we're going to dive into the coaching search for Virginia Tech football and some men's basketball after their tough couple of days in Brooklyn and look ahead to the ACC Big Ten Challenge coming up this week. Usual crew on set, Will Stewart, Chris Coleman, Nick Brown, Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes, and I'm your host, Jake Lyman. Let's look at the coaching carousel. It is spinning very fast over the last couple of days. I believe it was yesterday morning, Billy Napier was announced as the new head coach at Florida. And then yesterday, the big news, Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma to go to USC. So some of the holes being filled, some new ones opening. Uh, Hokies still maybe waiting it out, trying to see if they can find their man. Yeah, and... uh... This year, you know, there was going to be a lot more turnover than last year, and but even now, like there's a little more than I thought it would be. Like I never would have guessed Lincoln Riley would have just upped and left a really, really good job yep. at Oklahoma for for USC. I mean, he's a he's a, he was born and raised in Lubbock, Texas. He's a Big Twelve guy. Uh, just it's a strange move. But then you look at his recruiting class and you see like half of them come from Southern California, <laughs> right? So. Uh, I guess from that stand, he's one of those guys who can recruit really well no matter where he's at, yeah. uh, apparently. Um, so, so what does that mean for for Virginia Tech? Like, if Tex was looking at Matt Campbell, then I'm sure Oklahoma would be looking at Matt Campbell. He seems like he'd be a great fit there. Will they go and hire Stoops uh, yeah. again? Um, obviously, uh, if Virginia Tech was looking at, at Billy Napier – then, you know, there's no way Tech could possibly outbid Florida for, for Billy Napier. You, you know, there have been times in this coaching search where I thought it was going to be Dave Clawson, and then he signed an extension. Yep. There have been times in this coaching search where I thought it was going to be Billy Napier. There have been times, all right, just in the last three days, Saturday I thought it was going to be Matt Campbell. Yesterday the name Tony Elliott got floated to me again. Right. It was just like last December. Today – and I, you know, I can't read this word for word, but we're getting some indications that, uh, you know, some people think today that uh, Brent Pry, Brent Pry, uh, the, mm. the the Penn State, State defensive is he the coordinator, DC at Penn State? Yeah, he is. Right, right, right. And uh, you know, there, we had heard there had been some contact between uh, Whit Babcock and James Franklin, but and that was not about Virginia Tech trying to hire James Franklin away from Penn State. That was <laughs> who about, also got an extension. Right, right. That 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 was about Whit you know, doing his homework on, on Brent Pry. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Witt has done his homework on a lot of candidates. Uh, uh, Brent Pry, by the way, was a grad assistant at Tech back in 1995. Um, so I don't know who, who, who whose name is it going to be tomorrow. Yeah. Right? That's three and three days for me. And <clears throat> I know at this point I'm just waiting. Right, man. right. And uh, I, I look, I want to get it over with as quickly as possible because um, everybody's tired of coaching search, especially now that – the season's over and you're not going to have a game. You know, we don't have a game to look forward to this week. So that's what everybody's going to be thinking about all week is a coaching search. But it's important for for Wit to I'm sure Wit wants to get it over with more than anybody. <laughs> yeah, he didn't look yeah. exhausted when I uh, saw him Saturday. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh but it's important to not give in to those emotions of just saying, God, all right, who's number one on my list right now? Let's just hire him and get it over with. Right. If you mm-hmm. feel like you need to interview a couple of more yeah. guys and and, serve, and you know, cross all your T's and dot all your I's and everything like that, then and if you've got to take a little while longer to do that, you need to do it because that's some this is a very important hire. Yeah, it's it's it's, just, it's the future of the football program. Um you know, it just it's it's extremely important to the entire athletic department, to businesses in this entire region, uh, to the entire fan base all across the state. And uh, so, yeah, I, I want to get it over with as quickly as possible. But but I also don't want a any rash, rash decision. decisions yeah. to be made j- just for the sake of getting over with uh, you know a few days quicker. So the physical part of me wants it to be over soon because I'm, I'm getting kind of tired, you know. <laughs> but the business part of me wants it to go on for a long time. It's been good for business. <laughs> I'm uh, sure the YouTube questions are filled with questions. About right. This, so. <laughs> it's, it's just it's, it's fascinating, the stuff you hear. And, you know, it, it, we're at the point where we don't really lend any more credence to one rumor than we do another. You know, it's just interesting stuff we've heard. 
So heard that uh, Witt was doing pretty well with uh, Billy Napier until the Florida job opened up, and that was kind of the end of that. Um, Bill O'Brien has is a name that keeps coming up. I'm not saying that's who Tech's going to hire. I'm just talking about stuff we've heard. And people were asking me Saturday, who's our next coach? And I'm like, oh, it's Matt Campbell. <laughs> I was totally convinced. And, yeah. and then I'm just not. Then somebody says, well, Campbell wants a bunch of money. He wants $8 million. Uh, and, and, oh, no. and that makes sense because Campbell's in a really good situation where he is right now. And if he's asking, you know, if that room, fun rumor is true and he's asking $8 million, then what he's saying is that's what it's going to take to pry me away from yeah. what is not – a dodgy situation for me at all. They were a top ten team entering the season, I yeah. believe. Right, and, and, and they're putting together their best recruiting class of his twenty fourth in the cut, which is insane for Iowa for State. Iowa State. State. State normally recruits in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. Well, they've recruited in on average about ten spots higher under Campbell, but now they've they've jumped up from like the forties yeah. to number twenty four, which is insane for Iowa State. This would be like Virginia Tech signing a top five class. Signing a top 25 class for Iowa State has probably never happened before. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned Matt Campbell and maybe the Oklahoma job. Do you think the opening at Oklahoma maybe uh, slows down the process for Virginia Tech? Uh, it's possible. Uh, you know, you could – this is just speculation on my part, and I'm not saying I think this is what happened, uh, but it is possible. You know, uh, word leaked out yesterday, obviously, that Lincoln Riley was leaving, but, but maybe word had gotten around – throughout coaching circles a day or so earlier. And it just, there was a lot of smoke around Matt Campbell latter stages of last week and, uh, and, 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 and into Saturday, especially on Saturday. And it's possible that, that, that Oklahoma knew Lincoln Riley was going to leave and they started doing their own search behind the scenes and vetting candidates and putting out feelers and things like that. And, you know, maybe Campbell was set to come to Virginia Tech, but then maybe that Oklahoma job opened up and he feels like he's a really strong candidate for it and he can make – and they pay him $8 million. So then he comes back to Tech and said, okay, we may well. We were talking five and a half, six million, something like that, but Oklahoma's going to pay me eight. Right. Right? Yeah. It's it's possible. I, I don't I don't know that. I'm just, I'm just speculating. But that's part of the domino effect of this entire coaching carousel. Yeah, and every time another job opens up, it, it, it shifts the dynamics of everything. And, and you know, putting on your orange and maroon glasses, you can say, yeah, uh, you can make it make $8 million at Oklahoma, and, and they're going into the SEC. You can just leave it at that, yeah. you know. Or you can make five and a half, six million at Virginia Tech, and, and the pathway to winning the Coastal and being able to play in the ACC championship game is, uh, is an easier one, yeah. you know. Uh, just some coaching news at the moment just dropped a minute ago. Uh, Rhett Lashley, the offense coordinator for Miami, is going to do SMU. As and the head SMU coach. coaches uh, going to TCU, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, that literally just dropped a minute ago. And uh, Oklahoma woke up to plenty of trader banners hanging around Norman uh, all over the town, apparently. Big, big, like bed sheets. Yeah, everywhere. get out of town, Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't hang around. Yeah, yeah. Send he's somebody wear, back in disguise to pack up He's got to wear a hoodie when he comes back. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, you know, there's always been rumors, but I'm sure the Oklahoma fans, they were probably shocked when that news came out. Yeah. It, it, looking at the recruiting class, it, it makes sense. It and does that, make sense. And that sense may actually now. wind up being a really right. good and, hire and, by and, USC. And, and somebody made an observation yesterday. I forget one of the national guys. I think it was probably David Hale. And he said, some guys just don't want to coach in the SEC. Uh, I don't know what Oklahoma's reputation is on the recruiting trail as no, far as being clean or dirty. Ah, uh, I don't. They don't have a dirty reputation. Yeah. Well, if it's clean, then yeah, who wants to go coach in the SEC? Where it, it just ratchets up the pressure. Um, the thing is about you know, it doesn't necessarily change Oklahoma's recruiting any because they're recruiting a lot of Texas anyway, right? And obviously a, a lot of California yeah. kids. So, I, but. I don't know. It's it's just one of those things where he wants to win a national championship and make the playoffs and everything. And he's basically been making the playoffs just about every year at Oklahoma. But you're you're going to have to navigate a lot tougher opposition now. So the wear and tear on your football team. Just the wear and tear. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like there's no there's no easy week in the, for an NFL team, right? right. Um, like, like, look at poor Urban Meyer. It's like there's no Vanderbilts in the NFL, yeah. right? 
Um, and the SEC just keeps loading up on all these teams. But at one point, is that going to come to their own detriment? Uh, yeah, that was just going through my head as you were as you were talking. Maybe, maybe this is the beginning of it. A coach saying, "I, I don't want to go coach there. Right. I will go somewhere else, and I will try to make the playoffs and beat an SEC team, SEC team right. maybe once. Right. But I don't want to have to be beating them every I single beat week. Five top ten teams every year. Yeah. I mean, don't think about it. There, there are some down teams. Obviously, obviously, Florida's down right now. Texas, who's going to be joining the SEC, is down. LSU's down. But what if all those schools are actually hire the right coaches and they're all operating at max efficiency? Yeah. You could have they're, seven, nine, and three teams. They're just going to eliminate each other. Yeah. Um, so th- if that probably won't happen, but it's possible. So like they, they may have the SEC may have backed themselves into a corner to a certain extent where they're too good, and they and you don't want to overschedule, but like there's some of those schools that are going to be overscheduled now just just from their own conference schedule. And you can already see it with Alabama even. You put Alabama in any of the other Power 5 conferences, they're probably a one-loss team with a bunch of blowouts. But they almost lost to Auburn, went to four overtimes this mm-hmm. week, almost lost to a bad LSU team this year. You're seeing the best program in the country over the last decade struggling with some of these lower-level SEC teams. I saw Nick Saban's rant about that on the radio show yes. this past week. No, I have not seen it yet. Oh, um, he, uh, was fantastic. He, he talked about – it was, was like a three-minute rant where he talked about – you know, we get we're Alabama. You know, we've been the best program in the country for ten years. We get everybody's best shot. Now. I know nobody has. Well, to it's deal like with being that. Duke basketball at its peak. Yeah, they right. got everybody's, and probably are still getting everybody's right, best right, shot. Right, right. That's the team everybody wants to beat. And uh, so he 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 went on a rant. He's like, when I first got here, people were just happy when we won a game, and now if we don't win by fifty. We're, we, we're a failure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he was really he was really sticking up for his players. Dude, you're yeah. 70. Retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you got to have something to do, go be an analyst, you know. But uh, I don't know. It's probably it's probably in his blood. But He's too competitive. All right. So George has taken over from them. So he's not going to stand idly by and let that happen. Yeah. Maybe he's, that'll kind of rejuvenate him and rejuvenate that program. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, he, now he he sees another – he's going to see another challenge now. He's like, okay, George is taking it from us. How do I take it back from George? Yeah. yeah. And, and having been in the internet business for 25 years, I can – I can relate to that where sometimes you're the top dog and other times people are nipping at your heels and, mm-hmm. and it, it makes you change direction and do right. things different, you know, but get, getting back to the Duke thing, I always said one of the best things about Mike Krzyzewski was that he built that program knowing that once they got to be the best then they were going to get everybody's best shot. So he, now it wasn't like Duke was a bad basketball team or anything like that, but he built it up to that championship level and then he had the mindset to keep it there, you know, and that, that kind of, that kind of skill set and, and approach to the game is rare. Well, and speaking of Duke, more changes in the coaching world. David Cutcliffe will not be returning to coach the Duke Blue Devils, so another ACC opening. I think we kind of knew that was coming. And I, and I feel bad for Cutcliffe that he went out like this. And this is what happens when coaches hold on too long. Yeah. And I, I'm not, But you see him do it all the time. So I think it's easy from the outside looking in, but maybe if you're on the inside, you don't necessarily see that you're slipping to a certain extent. But he's done such a great job at Duke and how it's ended, not winning an ACC game this year and pretty much yeah. getting leveled in every single game that yeah. you play. Yeah. It, it kind of taints a little bit of what he accomplished there. I mean, he got shut out by UVA. How do you not <laughs> score against UVA's defense? <laughs> and then blown out by Miami 10 the, the, their the, season and two. The, the thing is now, like – if if he had retired three or four years ago, like Duke, Duke right now is not a good job, and I'm not saying it would have been a good job three or four years ago, but it would have been viewed as a better job. Yeah. He won the coastal in 2013, right? Right. Ten games and the coastal. Ex- exactly. So wasn't that long ago? Wasn't that long ago in, in the grand scheme of things? So at that point, you're like, okay, okay, Duke's a better job than Wake Forest in the ACC. But now you look at it and say, well, Wake, Wake's the much better job yeah. because they're 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 doing better right now. Uh, but like. I, who are they going to hire? Who are they going to hire that's possibly going to be as good as peak David Cutcliffe? Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, it's interesting. I, I looked this up yesterday. Jim Grobe and, and David Cutcliffe did did coach in the ACC. I think both of them were there from 2008 mm-hmm. through to 2013, and both of them did remarkable jobs. Mark- and the, Had and a similar arc. Got a certain group of players, won a bunch of games, and then tailed off. And then, and then he stayed – Grobe stayed too long, too. He left he had, after he had the a, 2013 season. He had a losing record in his 
Uh, yeah, in his last five years. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and he's a better coach than that. He just held on too long in a, in a really, really tough job. When you're at Wake and you're at Duke, you have to be on point all the time to have a chance to, to compete. Yeah, just to and, compete. Right, right. So, you know, the same thing will probably happen to Clawson at some point. You know, once he reaches a certain age. Yeah. That that said, you don't want to trade him in if you're Wake Forest right now because you're you're getting peak Dave Clawson right now. This is peak That's Dave Clawson. Right. He's, he's, he's a really it. really good coach, and oh. he just got an extension. So he just got he an is no longer a candidate for the Hokies. No, nope, and he might be ACC champion. This yes. time next week. We've been talking about it all season, how the ACC's worst nightmare of a Wake Pitt ACC championship game could happen, and now it is finally No, that, that being said, it's going to be a very entertaining football game. I For think. sure. I think it's going to be more entertaining than the ACC championship It might game. be 55-52 with those two offenses. I mean, uh, the, Georgia's going to beat Alabama like 27-3. to three. Um, So remember, I sat here and I said, right about the time Tech was playing Pitt, I said, you know, is Pitt going to tank at the end of the year? Are they going to win 10 games and have a truly special season? And here they are, 10 and 2. Yep. So two two teams, I believe the winner goes to the Peach Bowl. Yeah, it sounds like they'll play probably like Ole Miss in the Peach Bowl or something like that, which, again, should be an entertaining game. Should be fun. Yeah, Yeah. especially Matt Corral on the other side. Uh, One last coaching change I wanted to get to, Sonny Dykes going to TCU. Mm -hmm. So possibly a uh, destination for Justin Fuente at Southern Methodist next year. Or, well, didn't we say last year? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear SMU. So so Rhett Lashley, the Miami offensive coordinator, going to SMU. I don't know about that. And there's big-time rumors right now that the Oklahoma job might be filled by Shane Beamer. That's number one on the list. They said if he was still on the staff. (laughs) They said if he was still on the staff today, he would be hired immediately. Interesting. I mean, he did take South Carolina six and six. He did. He did. And uh, you know, I know they're not paying him a lot at South Carolina. Well, not by head coaching three million. Oklahoma three million. That, that's that's, that's <laughs> like Oklahoma could triple his salary. Yeah. But I, I don't uh, think Shane would leave after, after one, one year. year. Uh, although, man, that Oklahoma job is a pretty attractive. Yeah, and, and Shane obviously doesn't care about the SEC stuff. He's perfectly comfortable coaching in the SEC. Mm-hmm. Um, so, man, I know it would, it would be, real it would be tough to real leave quick. your school after, after one year. Especially mm-hmm. the way but, he denied the Virginia Tech rumors. Right, right, right. But you get to get a chance to go to a playoff team. A playoff caliber. And it's a place that he would been for a long he, uh, time. That a place that he had been, he knows the lay of the land and everything like that. Man, that, uh, that would be... If he turned down that job, if he got the offer and he turned it down, that might be one he'd live to regret. Who knows? Although, so think about it this way. He's a popular guy right now at South Carolina, even though they lost to Clemson something like 30 to nothing. Right. He's a popular guy down there at South Carolina. This could be one of those agent rumors. Of course. You know, so, he can, so he can go from $3 million to, to hey, five. I'll let you hire me for $3 million. Now you got to pay me 5 or $6 million. I got because look, I actually went 6 and 6. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it could just be an agent thing trying to get him a raise. Yeah. Well, And he he adamantly denied the Virginia Tech rumor saying he wants his kids to graduate from Columbia high schools. And uh, if he left for Oklahoma, that would be almost as bad as Lincoln Riley's <laughs> I will not be the next oh, head boy. coach at LSU. Yeah, but, but he, he was so adamant in those comments <laughs> that – it, they're really hard to walk back from, like ever. Yes. Who are we talking about, Shane? Shane, or, Shane. Or, yes. Yeah. Was it really? Wow. Oh, gosh, yeah. It, if he went on like a one-minute rant about how he loved South Carolina. It was his dream job. He wants to, his kids to graduate high school. He wants to there. win an SEC championship and, here. Right, and, right. And and <laughs> and his kids aren't – his kids are still pretty young. His yes. has got a while before they graduate from high school. Like, <laughs> like that statement was so strong that that would make it – there would be some angry South Carolina fans if he yes. left after that. He's a, he's a guy who he, he likes to talk. You know, he can be emphatic, and mm-hmm. sometimes you got to just be careful. Yeah, yeah. But he'll learn. All right. Well, I think it's time to finally transition over to hoops. Uh, the happier topics of football Ugh. this week. Now we transition to a tough week at the Barclays Center for Virginia Tech. Let's start with the Memphis game. Uh, close all the way until the final few minutes. I mean, the Hemaline hits the three behind the Justin Mutz screen. Hokies went up 56-55 at that point. Like 4 15 left yeah, to go or something and, like that. And I don't think the Hokies scored again until Nahima Lean's free throws uh, as time expired. They still had, they had so many good looks down the stretch, too. It's not yeah. like they were sitting They went there. something like one for ten. Yeah. Uh, Luma missed three wide open threes in the final like two minutes. D- so. Depth in that game was obviously an issue. Like, yes. me- like Memphis played 12 guys. Yeah. And and basically, Aluma and Storm Murphy just about played forty minutes 
in that game and, and did not play well. Right, and and th- those those t- it's it's tough to play against Memphis Memphis's talent for basically forty minutes, especially when they have so much depth and they're just bringing fresh bodies into the game. I think I heard one after they, they, they use five guys five to, guys to guard Storm. Storm. Yep. and wow. uh, they, that's it's. I'm, I'm not. I was disappointed at, offensively in Tech. Um, I, I didn't think they played as well as they, they they could have played offensively on the whole. But at the same time, like Memphis has, they're number one in, in defensive efficiency, and I right. think they were top five in defensive efficiency last year. They they play defense extremely well at Memphis. So I mean, I thought that game was going to be in the 60s, uh, and it was. But I thought Tech had a good chance to win it if it was in the 60s. I would have been concerned if it got up into the 70s and the 80s, and the, I didn't think there'd be any way Tech could could outscore them. Um, but I, I was not really surprised by Memphis's defense. Yeah. I wasn't surprised by Tech rushing their shots in the face of that defense and shooting a lower percentage. I was surprised at how biased the telecast was oh and God. how over the top. It, it, it's some, they, at one point, it was, remember when Tech played Duke and Castle and Zion, Zion didn't play? <laughs> Zion cam. And they had the they Zion, had Zion cam. cam. They, had, they had the Larry Brown cam. Larry Brown I'm like, are you Wallace kidding cam. me? So yeah. at one point, you know, with about eight minutes left to go in that game, I'm thinking, you know, to beat Memphis would be nice, but I really want to watch these announcers squirm if right. Tech actually wins this game. Exactly. Because yeah. you're going to have to completely shift gears and talk about something different for the last five minutes. And I wasn't sure who the play-by-play broadcaster was. I know the color guy was Fran Fraschilla, oh, yeah. and uh, I think the peak of his bias was the Jalen Duran dunk, or uh, excuse me, block. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> don't you ever do that. Don't you dare do that. <laughs> I was like, are we yeah. listening to Memphis's radio call right, right now? On no, what, what I did like about Fraschilla is when he thinks something is a foul or when he thinks something is not a foul, he's not afraid to say it. Oh, no, he was calling out the refs. Yeah, yeah, he he was, yeah. um, He was basically like, and that was the weird thing about the Memphis game is like, they didn't call anything at the very beginning of the game. And then they started then calling they called a bunch everything. of everything. They everything. And then the second half, they were like, oh, man, we got to dial this back or else we're going to foul both teams out completely. <laughs> so they didn't call anything for most of the second half. So right. it was really hard, I guess, for both teams to Get into a figure out how to play. I yeah. tweeted, I tuned into this game to see the referees, and they are not disappointed. <laughs> they are dominating this game. Oh, man. That, that was like Teddy Valentine was not officiating that game either, was he? You would have thought he was. Yeah. Well, the Hokies, play, they played good defense. Amani Bates and Jalen Duran, 15 points combined, 5 of 17 shooting the ball. Yeah. I think if you had told us that the Hokies held those two guys to those stats, we would have felt pretty good about Virginia Tech winning that game. Yeah. would have felt pretty good, yeah. Amani had four free throws in like the final minute and a half also. Right. They, I believe that they combined to score two points in the first half. Mm-hmm. They did. So yep. That's right. And like five fouls between them. Ho- Hokies defense played well, but going to be tough to win any game when you shoot 34% from the floor, mm-hmm. 33% from three-point range, your point guard has six turnovers, and mm-hmm. your best player shoots five of 17 from the yeah. floor. Yeah, I know, and, and and so, you know, I'm sure we we may talk about the Xavier game a little bit, but let's let's look at big picture stuff. Um, I don't want to overstate it, but my confidence was pretty shaken coming out of coming out of that weekend, and particularly the way uh, Storm was completely ineffective. I get it against Memphis, and then he was ineffective against Xavier as well. That's that's two games in a row against a higher-level athlete than he ever saw when he was playing at yeah. Wofford. And he played fine in Tech's other non-conference games. So again, yeah. But now, as he took a step up in athleticism, he was very, very ineffective. And they're guarding him really closely all the way. I mean, he, he, doesn't, get, he doesn't get any rest when he's on the court at all because they're, they are guarding him close all right the way up the court. as they throw the ball in. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, they are, they are just trying to wear him down physically from, from start to finish, and they're defending and, and, him with And so the guys. lack of ball handlers in general right, right. on this team is getting exposed. So, now, you saw it a little bit against against Xavier is, you know, you started to see some other guys bring the ball up the court, and he was kind of playing off the ball to try to get a little pressure uh, taken off of him. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll be interested to see how Mike Young can, can counter that. Yeah, because I, I do. I don't think like there's certain matchups, obviously, that are going to be difficult for him. But at the same time, I fully believe that he's a better player than he showed yeah, this past absolutely. weekend. I do too. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Mike Young is able to do to maybe take 
the pressure off of him. So I, I did not expect Storm Murphy to be blowing past people and making no, layups and no. things like that. What I thought coming into the season is you would see ball movement that would outpace the defense. Yeah, right, and he would and, make and his and open shots. Right, and I think that's one of the things they struggled with against both Memphis and Xavier was I just didn't see the ball movement that I expect out of a Mike Young offense. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, you know, he, he can work on that and get it figured and, and out. And he hasn't shot the ball as well. Like from three point range is is he's capable oh, of three doing against it. Xavier, right? Yeah. And and they were open looks too, except for the first one. Um, but but whether you, I mean an open look is an open look, whether you're playing a Southern Conference team or, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, an open look is an open look, and he's he did knock him down this yeah. weekend. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what Mike Young can do to get him freed up a little bit more as far as like his ball handling and bringing the ball up the court. And, and if you're sitting out there and you're like, well, they need to bench him for Padula. Padula was great. It's a small Padula played size. limited minutes. You know, he, what he, he did he, was very encouraging. Yes. Gosh, and I will give Fran Fursella credit for this. He loves him some Sean Padula. Does he kept – oh, he kept on comparing him to the yeah, villain over Colin Gillespie. Colin Gillespie. Yeah. He's, like, he's like, I saw this – no, Fursella got to see Tech practice a few weeks ago. Right. So he was like – and I, he's like, I don't want to – I don't want to go all in on the Padula bandwagon, but after I saw them practice, I'm thinking Connor Gillespie. Mm. And then he started doing what he did in the game the other night. I mean, he had like – it wasn't just the two shots he made, those two steals that he had too. Right, he had a yeah. big he came up on his backside. Shot. Yeah. Um, so very impressive performance. Um, very excited about his future. Uh, and he, I, he's, he's a good athlete. That he was oh, the he's, one who he's dunked a, in practice. Oh, he's, right? a, he's a better athlete than Storm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he was a higher-rated recruit. Than Storm, he's, he's Storm with more athleticism, I would say. Padula six points off the bench against Xavier, and that's big for Virginia Tech against Memphis. Darius Maddox was the only bench player to score and the only player off the bench to play more than four minutes. And, and you mentioned the depth in that game when yeah. Memphis has I, ten deep. You, you got to. I, I was feel like you got to find a way to get Ojiako a few more minutes, especially in that Memphis yeah. game. To just, I mean. Luma had to have been gassed at the end of the game. Yeah. And I know he could have been more aggressive and things like that, but like when when you've got to play hard for basically 40 minutes against those athletes in that style of game, um I, I just think it's it's extremely difficult to expect him to be, you know, 100% effective at the end of the game. So I would have liked to have found a way to to get Ojiako still a few minutes, you know, Get, you know, I'm, and I'm I'm not saying yes. In big games, you're going to see Aluma play more minutes, but yeah. it, it just seemed like he was. I, I know Ojiako came in briefly in the first half, but I don't think Aluma came off the court at all in the second half. I'd have to go back and check. So, so but, that's the other guy you got to kind of do a confidence check on. There's Storm Murphy and there's Kevin Aluma, and I'm sure one of the things going through Aluma's mind right now is, I mean, I know he's played a lot of basketball, including in the ACC, but uh, you know, he he did that that NBA thing and where we got a lot of advice what it's going to take to succeed in the league yeah. and got to figure he's just saying to himself after these two games yep that's what they meant that's the kind of stuff i'm yeah. going to be facing in the nba and i got to figure that out mm-hmm. well the Hokies going to try and bounce back again lost to memphis lost to xavier but that xavier game it felt like one they still should have won even though xavier had nate johnson put down 30 <sighs> points yeah well the thing about i mean they were missing a bunch of players but at the same time it kind of evened itself out when he scored 30. Yes. He's not supposed to score 30, and he's yeah. not going to go, what was he, 7 of 11? 7 of outside? 11. 7 of 11. I mean, and Frischilla was saying, oh, Tech's not guarding him, Tech's not guarding him. And I agree they didn't do a great job guarding him. But it wasn't that bad. But, but right, right. Generally speaking, it's not like he had three seconds each time to just really get his feet set. I mean, no. uh, you know, I, I think probably the mistake Tech made was the last shot he made. Uh, you're up by two. And Frischilla said this. He yeah. said, look, you're up by two. And there's a driver going to the basket. In no circumstance do you come off of Johnson on the three-point line. And who did that? Padula. 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 The yeah, fr- it was a know, freshman was mistake. Freshman. Yeah. Right. Just, just for a second he stepped back and that was right, all Right, that's all it took. And he, he got, actually closed him down pretty well. But the guy was just hot. And the, the idea there, of course, is – to not let him catch the ball at all, you need to stay on him and make sure he doesn't catch the ball. Yeah, and make yeah. them make make, make them, somebody else make make a him shot. make a contested shot in traffic to tie it, as opposed to a semi open look from three point range to win it. And and then and, of course Kevin missing the free throw that would have put Tech up right, three. Right, and yes. uh, which again, you know, it's Ojiako's you know, not playing very much, and Aluma's basically on the court for forty minutes, and you're right. worn out at the end of the game. He didn't play at all. So like, what's going on there? 
Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, it, so that that's so I, I think now, you know, with a couple of games against a good competition, uh, I think Mike Young. He should probably have a better idea of, uh, of his team now. So it, we'll, it's we'll, good experience, right? Right. We'll see if that rotation looks any different again, against the Maryland. Maryland game. Now that he's had a, you know a, a couple of days to think. Because we it. so we talk about this all the time, and there's so many games played in basketball, and stuff starts starts getting put on tape, and there's an ebb and flow to the season. And Tech is like at the very beginning of James Johnson's career, Tech started out eight and zero or something like that, and then the tape was out. Other teams adjusted, yeah. and Virginia Tech did not, it, and it, they stunk. Right. And, and uh, I don't think that's Mike Young. No, 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 of course not. Um, did Xavier end up winning the tournament? They beat Iowa State. Mm. Uh, Iowa State beat Memphis ha. by 20. By oh. tw- 79. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so here's the thing. Going into this, Iowa State won two games last year. They have I a know. new coach. So going into this tournament, I thought, okay, the worst Virginia Tech is going to do in one and, is one and one. Yeah. If, they, if they beat Memphis, they're going to play Xavier in the, in the title game. But if they lose to Memphis – the sorry Iowa State team is going to get absolutely run by Xavier, and then Virginia Tech's going to play a sorry <laughs> Iowa State team. Yeah. And, and they the, destroyed the, both of them. Right, exactly. So here we have a two-win team going into the preseason in IT, not only winning in it, but just thrashing everybody they play. I think they're going to be ranked this week. It seems like they're, it. They're unbeaten and just beat two ranked teams in three nights. Yeah, yeah. Man, so I didn't watch their game against uh, Memphis, but I did watch their game against Xavier, and I, I thought Xavier was more talented. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But the more I watched, the more I thought, Iowa State's really well coached. Mm-hmm. Me- Memphis turned the ball over, I want to say, 12 times in the first 10 minutes of the game, and Iowa State just typical. could not miss for that, three. That, that was probably the disappointing part. Maybe the most disappointing part of the Tech-Memphis game is lack of turnovers. Like Memphis has been turning the ball over 20-plus times every game and what I think they only had 13 or 14 against Tech, which seems like a decent amount, but for Memphis it's not. Should have been more. Yeah. All right, I have to say before we move on to the YouTube questions, my Hunter Couture Nahima lean theory is now dead. They combined for 31 <laughs> points uh, against Xavier on 12 of 26 shooting, so I will stop talking about it. <laughs> uh, I thought I thought it might keep going. It was through seven games of the season or six games of that the season. That only one of them plays well. That only one of them plays well. Nahim was the only one to play well against Memphis. Couture didn't, but uh, they both had good games against Xavier. And David Cunningham is in the room. I believe the Couture charge count is up to six now. And that was very early in that game, too. It was. Yeah. He got it out of the way. He didn't have one against Memphis. I didn't have one against Memphis. So he's six six for seven at this point. That's still a still a good clip. Yeah. So uh, and and let's give a shout out to Aline. I thought he looked like he got off he to played a great. He, he, got, he got off to a tough start to the season and was just really wasn't letting the game come to him, but. Uh, He's really lit it up these last two games against yeah. against better competition. And we saw that against Florida in the NCAA tournament. It seemed like he finally started to figure it out, and I think he could be the Hokies' leading scorer this season. Hey, if, he keeps it going. If, if he wants to have off nights against Cornell <laughs> and Radford, that's fine. Have at it. Yeah, <laughs> just have your good games for, for the good teams. <laughs> Lots of good games coming up for Virginia Tech over the next couple of weeks. Maryland on Wednesday is the first of them, and we'll t- dive into that on Wednesday's podcast a little bit more as well. Let's send it over to Nick. Any good questions in the chat today? Uh, the first big question uh, by uh, Dan Steinbach. Uh, shout, shout out, out. Dan Steinbach. Yep. Uh, was, did you guys know that Imani Bates is only 17 years old? I did because I no uh, they actually said it in the uh, in, in the broadcast. They said he was they, I read, they that, said, I read that in the, Memphis's game notes, but they didn't mention I it I should at call all. up Fran Fraschilla and see if he knows. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, he, one of them said it in the broadcast, either either Fraschilla or the, or the play-by-play. That's yeah. the, they mentioned it multiple times. <laughs> yeah. It was way too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, not, many, uh, not many questions uh, you know, that you guys haven't run through, but I had uh, one first question. If you had uh, to list you know, a top candidate right now for choice, <laughs> well, I mean, after all the mayhem that's well, kind of settled. Saturday, right now. I thought it was Campbell. Yesterday, briefly, I thought it was Elliot. Today, I think it's Brent Pry. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with Brent Pry because that's what I've heard gonna today. I'm going to hear a different name tomorrow, and the answer is going to change. So, <laughs> so don't 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 take any of this seriously. We'll, <laughs> we'll find I, out. I think yeah. my guy Charles Huff is out of it. Although maybe he'll come back around as as these things keep shifting. By the way, did you catch his press conference that he said when someone asked him about the tech rumors? He had a he had a great um, response to that, talking about how you know he hasn't. Yeah, I don't know where you've heard that. And he shuffled and danced. He's yeah, definitely. But it was and danced. masterfully done. I thought <laughs> it's interesting because <laughs> I've, I've I've watched a couple of Charles Huff podcasts where he was 
He was very glib, and glib is a complimentary word. He was just da, 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 da. They asked him about Virginia Tech, and he kind of, well, mm, uh, 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 and he danced around <laughs> he it, hard. But, but he wasn't as glib and rapid fire as he usually is. And you mentioned Matt Campbell, too. His press conference was, it did not seem like he was returning to Iowa yeah, State in that. It seemed very, very emotional. emotional. Yeah, uh, yeah his, uh, I linked to the, his, the senior day video of him crying yeah. uh, on, on the boards. Yeah. Uh, it was t- the video was done by a local TV station, and it was for like the last five players that came through Senior Day, and the, the camera was on Matt Campbell each time for every single player, and it was it was highly emotional. Yeah, and I don't I don't really I don't really have a favorite at this point to answer your question. I mean, um, you want my favorite or the guy I think it's going to be? Well, well, I want Matt Campbell. I want Matt segment. Campbell, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he would be my favorite candidate that I personally want as head football coach. All right, and then uh, I mean. Uh, you know, people just kind of bashed UVA and yeah, yeah. Well, it's bashed Fran we like in the comments fair. today. Yeah. <laughs> so I get the impression that our YouTube chat is starting to turn into more of a chat. As yeah, it's, to, yeah, as it seems like, like people are just anymore. powwowing in there the entire time, which yeah. is good. More okay. interactive, I guess. Well, it's, it's Nick's, Nick's job to go through that, I guess. I, I like to weed through them. They're, they're pretty entertaining. <laughs> we'll have to remind people to ask more questions from now on. Uh, but good question, good question well, from Nick in the chat. And I, I, I do like scrolling through Twitter also. There's a couple rumors right now going around that Miami might target Mario Cristobal, um, poach him from Oregon. I, I mean, I'm like, sure they would cow. try, but I mean, he's. I mean, Oregon's not a bad job to have. It's not a bad job. <laughs> I would to not have. leave Oregon for Miami. And then no, I, I especially thought I, the dumpster fire they have down there. I thought I saw Oregon. If, if Cristobal leaves, they want Dave Aranda from well, Baylor. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just open all these jobs up again. I, I'm not. I'm not. Well, I personally wouldn't take the Miami job, but any. Anytime, but I especially wouldn't take it right now that they don't have an athletic director, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, and that kind and of they also saying. just pulled a crap ton of money out of football. R- right. And so I just, <laughs> first of all, they haven't fired Manny Diaz, have they? No. As far as I know. <laughs> so it's like, we're going to get this new coach. Right. right. So we still have another one right now. <laughs> why, why would you go there and take that job without even knowing who your AD was going to be, even if they did fire exactly. Manny Diaz tomorrow? Well, who does that job? Does the president of Miami go and fly out to Oregon and right. talk to Crystal? Right. So that's, that's just, <laughs> could be w- could be worse. Right. You could be Miami right now, which uh, right they as opposed to being Crystal Ball or Diaz, or you could Texas. actually be Miami. Could be yes. Texas. Yeah. That's true as and well. It, who, yeah. That's, That's true. They yeah. finished second in the coastal. They did. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. With a backup freshman quarterback. Hey, that man's yes. legit though. Oh, and guess what? You know, the only team in, in the coastal that did better than seven and five this year was Pitt, of course. <laughs> and they're losing Kenny Pickett. This division is wide open. <laughs> I feel like wide that should just be like bad. the slogan for co- for the Coastal. ACC Coastal, wide open. Wide open. Always. <laughs> Always. Stinks. <laughs> it's the most exciting division in college football. It is. Like coastal parody. chaos kind of rolls off the top. It does. Yeah, than, coastal chaos. Wide yeah. open. <laughs> All right. Well, that should just about wrap it up on episode 212 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Chris, what's coming up on Tech Sideline the next few days? <sighs> Well, we'll have a uh, Brandon Patterson article tomorrow to review the UVA game. Uh, I assume Will will have Monday thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll today. squeeze something um, out today. I'm kind of playing it by year after that. Um, there's no more coaching stuff to write, so I'll probably do an Inside the Numbers article later this week once the PFF grades get finalized. We'll go back to a Friday Q&A this week. I didn't have anything to say this past Friday. Like, I have more <laughs> questions than I do have answers at this point, right. so I didn't do a Q&A on Friday. Um some of them we got to play by ear because there's no football game this week. But uh, no yeah. press conferences. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll come up with some stuff. Well, and David said you have a preview coming on Maryland as well, and you'll be at the game for that one too. Uh, and David Cunningham making his long-awaited debut, writing the TTL notes tonight. So. Oh, <laughs> congratulations! David. I know. Hey, uh, hey, with me. Yes, Nick. Uh, Nick in the fourth chair and Jack Brizendine. I'm who heading does out TTL in about an hour to... and wrestling coverage. They are going to Monday Night Football tonight. So, uh, opens up David for this long-awaited opportunity. I'm so happy for but, you. But, uh, God, you're you're really going to be glad that you accepted this job after you do those yeah, yeah. TTL notes. No, I'm just glad it's at least partially. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I believe it should be all Mike Young. I don't think they'll have JC Price on today, but uh, either way. Enjoy it. You've transcribed enough before. It shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, uh, he's got David transcription Cunningham. skills. He, he's got it. So uh, look forward to that tomorrow morning from David Cunningham. 
That's going to wrap it up on episode 212 of the Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. I want to thank you all for tuning in and thank everybody on set. Will Stewart, founder and general manager of TechSideline.com, at Will Stewart, TSL on Twitter. To my right, Chris Coleman, lead analyst and columnist for Tech Sideline, at Chris Coleman, TSL on Twitter. Nick Brown, you can find him at Nick Brown 33 on Twitter. Did a great job in the fourth chair as always. Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes always does a phenomenal job. I'm your host, Jake Lyman, signing off. Have a great start to your week, Hokies fans. We'll see you next time.